uh, where China was now essentially uh, the diplomatic power broker in, in the Middle East, which for the United States' historical standpoint was kind of like a an oh shit moment. Um, and I think, you know, there isn't like always an all or nothing thing. And there's always like countervailing objectives that say the Saudis have and playing off the Chinese against against the United States for their own for their own strategic purposes. Obviously, China looks to the Saudi Arabia as a critical provider of their commodities, right? That's just like that's like the foundation of their relationship. They just rely on those energy imports. Um, so, you know, China has also reciprocated by providing, um, you know, ballistic missile support uh, and is willing to accommodate Saudis, um, you know, adventures uh, in other parts of the world, you know, as part of kind of a like there's there's a certain part of this which is geopolitics, and there's a certain part of a part of this which is you have to think about the CCP, the ruling families of the Gulf countries as their own sort of like extractive mafia, right? And so some parts of these relations are motivated and sort of seen through the prism of states with tax bases and populations and um, big big bureaucracies, and some parts of these relations are you know essentially motivated as like different mafias like carving up territory, right? And doing deals to support each other's, um, you know, criminal efforts, uh, 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 sort of criminal endeavors. And I think, you know, to a certain extent that you can see the ruling families of like the Emiratis and and, and the Saudis and and the CCP essentially as like mafia families. Um, and, and you have to kind of model that into how you think about how they how they see the world. And to a certain extent, look at, uh, because if they're essentially small groups of people that control vast quantities of wealth, they can do things that, you know, don't look like traditional state behavior, right? They don't look like, you know, setting up military bases. They don't look like, you know, doing port calls with aircraft carriers or doing training missions, et cetera, right? They look like venture capital deals. They look like, um, you know, cut out LLCs, putting millions of dollars into Western banks and financial institutions. And those um, are for other strategic purposes, whether it's to acquire strategic technologies or investments in different firms, whether it's to influence the political systems in the West, um, you know, via outright corruption or political, uh, you, you know, donations. And I think we have sort of discounted the the nature of the sort of Saudi uh, or the sort of the Gulf East uh, 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 alignment. It's essentially, if you zoom out, like where the surpluses are, they were essentially in Russia, you know, they were in, they're essentially in petro states and in manufacturing, you know, powers, essentially, you know, OPEC plus in China. And so the, the way that the U.S. has sort of run the last 50 years is that, you know, we would be the consumer of global goods. And so therefore we would essentially stimulate the economies of the global south, these emerging markets that produce raw commodities and then climb the value chain in manufacturing. And then they would recycle those dollars into our debts in a sort of a controlled, safe fashion where like we could um, sustain the benefits. I think those emerging powers sort of woke up though, and they realized they could leverage those dollars to, um, to essentially corrupt the imperial core, right? To sort of insinuate themselves into our, into our, into our system and to, to extract strategic benefits for themselves. And I think that's what you see now. And, and I think though the Russia, I think invasion has sort of broken kind of one, one aspect of that, um, what was more of like a quasi like just pretend it's not happening arrangement because now we had to go out and sanction all the Russian oligarchs. And that kind of broke sort of an implicit part of the deal, right? Was the Russian oligarchs and everyone in the Russian system could get immensely wealthy and they would just recycle their their wealth into Manhattan, South Beach, Miami. River's London. the best place to buy Bitcoin. Go to river.com slash TFTC, sign up today, set up an account and start stacking sets. Back to the Mayfair. Video you know, real estate, uh, et cetera. Um, and then Russia invaded, and now we have to sanction all of those, all those oligarchs, seize their yachts, seize their property, et cetera. And I think that signal then was cascaded down through what, you know, I call this kind of this, you know, state quasi mafias um, who were doing the same sort of thing for the past, you know, 30 years. And now they have to look at the that arrangement very differently. And so those Gulf powers, those, you know, Gulf, uh, you know, elite royal families, the Chinese uh, sort of elite families that have hundreds of billions of dollars in real estate overseas, they have to sort of reassess the risk to those assets uh, and start to find alternatives, right, to protect those assets, right? And also try to construct alternative um, financial institutions that they can, that are more safe for them. Um, so like a great example of this is, is, is Switzerland. So Switzerland has been seen as like, this bastion of you know financial autonomy and independence and you know banking secrecy for 100 plus years, it's where all you know the, the world's rogues kind of hide their money in Swiss numbered accounts and or just gold 
gold bullion inside mountains. And they looked at the Russian invasion, the sanctions, and the Swiss government uh, you know, passed uh, changes to their bank secrecy laws that essentially you know, undid a huge portion of, of the secrecy protections. Um, and then a number of accounts were essentially unmasked and had assets seized. And that I think is like a sense like a shockwave, you know, not at the geopolitical level to first order, but to like those like networks of mafias that control trillions of dollars, right? But also happen to be, you know, sort of heads of states or cousins of the heads of states, right? And so it does have geopolitical impacts because what it then precipitates is, uh, for example, the emergence of um, alternative financial centers like um, like Abu Dhabi Global Markets in Abu Dhabi or DIFC uh, in, in 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 Dubai that are now trying to essentially position themselves as alternative financial centers to um, absorb some of that um, scared capital, right? And so to the extent that this capital starts to flow out of, say, the city of London, flow out of Switzerland, flow out of New York and Miami real estate into Abu Dhabi, uh, into uh, Dubai, into Singapore, into Hong Kong, that is a strategic challenge to the sort of the whole global arrangement, right? now, Saudi Arabia, so this is where it's like oil matters, but it's like oil is just one input into like, okay, they sell the oil, but then they get a bunch of dollars. What do they do with those dollars, right? That actually matters a lot more than just the unit of account they used to sell the, to sell the, the, um, the commodity itself. Because it's that, it's that capital that is what provides power depending on how it's deployed in the, in the global system. If it just sits in a treasury account – you know, at the Fed, it doesn't give the Saudis a whole lot of power. It's safe to the extent that they think that it's not going to be, you know, you know blocked or, 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 um, or devalued, which is increasingly a new risk they have to price in. But they also realize that the value of that capital can be deployed much more strategically. And so this is why you've seen the emergence of sovereign wealth funds like the PIF, like ADQ, like ADIA, like, uh, like MGX, and, as, and also the Chinese have their own sort of sovereign, sovereign leverage funds to do something similar. Uh, and so the world is now being sort of shaped, not just by kind of the traditional geopolitical, um, you know, arrangements or sort of, you know, tit for tat, kind of traditional diplomatic uh, and military um, kind of positioning, but now the sort of networks of immense global capital flows that are controlled by a small number of sort of autocrat um, sort of elites in the Gulf uh, and in Asia. And the West sort of has a strategic vulnerability to that, right? 